In the outback, no one can hear you scream. For those hardy enough to explore its untouched wilderness and diverse landscapes without seeing another human for days, most would never encounter a single mishap. But for those unlucky few, the red dirted Never Never could have become their graves. From an invite from an unfriendly local to an abduction nightmare, these are five real outback horror stories. Welcome back to another Halloween special here on Shadow Matter. All throughout October, I will be releasing real-life horror stories from the internet as posted by real people. If you missed the last episode, a link will be provided in the description below. This week's episode, we're going to be focusing on real-life horror stories from the outback in Australia. Before we go on, I would like to disclaim that these stories were not submitted to myself or written by me. Some stories may appear wildly fictitious and not based in any reality. Also, it should be noted that some of the stories have been edited for time. If you would like to see the stories in their full glory, links to the stories will also be provided. So without further delay, put a log on the fire and pull up a seat, and let's delve into the stories. This story was posted on Reddit by the author, Ask I Am. I was on a road trip with my girlfriend at the time, and the car broke down. Well, I killed the battery because I'm an idiot and was charging my RC car off of it. We were in the middle of nowhere, off the Barrier Highway, South Australia. Some rando in a ute decided to stop and see if we were okay, and as soon as he got out of his car, I could see that he was intoxicated. He gave us a jump start, and we got my car running again. At this point in time, it was getting dark, and we were in Roo country, and my car wasn't built for dealing with Roos, so I asked the guy where the nearest town was so he could find somewhere to stay. He said something like, what? Come and stay at my place. I'll get the missus to do up some grub. It was a bad vibe. But I didn't want to drive and my girlfriend didn't have her license. So we agreed. Bad move. Got back to his house when we went in and was greeted by his wife who was lovely so we felt a little reassured. He cracked out some beers so we got drinking and was watching the country music channel. After too many beers, old mate started yelling at the TV. Play some Shania Twat. I want some Shania Twat. Meaning Shania Twain. He was stoked at his wordplay. His wife asked him to calm down, but this just got him riled up. He punched his wife, she ran off to the bedroom, and then he followed, yelling at her. We could hear him hitting her more, and we sat there looking at each other, not knowing what to do. I yelled out and suggested he come out and smoke a joint with me. Really bad move. After we smoked, we came back inside, and shit got worse. He kept yelling at his wife and pushing her. I asked him to stop, and he yelled at me, then went into another room. A few minutes later, he came out with a crossbow and a bunch of bolts that had four pointed razor tips and said, I want to kill something. My girlfriend and I were terrified and I suggested we go set up some targets, hoping that we weren't them. He said he would get something out of the shed and his wife, who was in tears at this point, went into the bedroom. We figured this was our only chance to escape, so we quickly grabbed our stuff and ran out to the car and took off. It was about 4am at this point. I was drunk and stoned and I drove while my girlfriend called the police. Eventually, we got far enough away from this place, and the sun was coming up, so we felt we were safe. Never heard back from the police, and have never travelled back to that part of Australia. This story was posted on Thought Catalogue by the author, David O'Connor. I used to be an avid camper. I would travel out into the outback and camp out for a day or two. But after this particular incident, I'm not going to go out there again, even with a group of people. It was last year around August to be precise. There was some pretty bad rain the day before I left home to go camping. My friend, another experienced camper, joined me this time. We were to go in deeper than where I usually camped. The ride out was bumpy and slow. The road was washed out due to some flash floods, but relatively all right nonetheless. When we made it out there, the sun was just about setting. We gathered up some brush and set it on the damp ground and pitched camp. My friend lit a fire and sat around it while eating some jerky. We shot the shit mostly about our jobs and our girlfriends. It was around this point I got to go up and pee. I walked out into the brush. The brush was tall and thick, so having the fire within my line of sight was important. All of a sudden, I hear my friend calling my name. I look up and the voice seems to be coming from some distance away from the camp. How did he get over there so fast, I thought. He called out my name again. This time, I sensed urgency in his voice. 
I called his name and started walking towards the voice. This went on for a little while until something came from behind. It tackled me and I yelped in terror. It was my friend. His face as serious as you could get and he held a finger to his lips. Then his voice shouted my name from somewhere. He slowly stood up, craning his head left and right, as if to search for the source of the voice. He motioned for me to stand up. I realized then that I had lost sight of the camp. I had no idea where I was. The voice shouted my name again, but it sounded further away. We made our way back to camp and quickly packed up our belongings without saying a word. Back in the car, my friend broke the silence. Whatever it was, it wasn't human. I nodded. Back home, I couldn't shake the idea that this creature, or whatever it was, had the ability to call my name in my friend's voice no less. I spoke with a local priest who revealed to me that in the outback, there are evil spirits who prey on people. These spirits lure people away using familiar voices, never to be seen again. This story was posted on Reddit by the author, Creepy Oz. I grew up on a huge remote cattle station in the Australian countryside. Out here, it's not the stereotypical outback you might see in Hollywood movies. We're a long way from any city, but we're far enough away outside the desert that we have grass and hills and valleys and thick pockets of bushland. Out here, weirdness is an everyday occurrence. Back then, we had a small army living on the station between mum, dad and three kids and the three remaining grandparents, an uncle and two cousins, two housemaids and all the farmhands. Because we had more farmhands, dad was able to leave much of the day-to-day -day stuff up to them and spend time with us kids, which was nice. He used to take us camping in different spots on the station, sometimes fishing down by one of the rivers. Sometimes we'd have a bonfire out on the open paddocks and sometimes we'd explore places we rarely ever went. We could never really have a proper holiday, so these trips were the way that dad made up for it, I guess. The trip in question was to one of the more remote spots on the property. A hilly area way out in one of the edges covered in tussock and littered with steep ravines. Dad always used to be a bit of a conservationist. He had an idea that some kind of lizard that was in trouble in other areas might live out there. So my brother and I went along as little helpers. We spent most of the day setting up little drop traps for whatever critters might be scurrying around, as well as throwing dirt at each other and chasing each other around the big tussocks. It was high summer and the sun was up to at least 8.30 and we took advantage of the warm evening. That night, we cooked bacon over a roaring fire and had bacon sandwiches and toasted marshmallows and billy tea. Sometime during the night, I woke up to what sounded like footsteps outside the tent. I tried to rouse Dad, quietly, without success, so I was forced to lie there and listen. I wasn't afraid as such. There are loads of animals all over the property, and I was a country kid, so my first thought was wildlife rather than little girl eating monster. After a few minutes, whatever was out there went away, and I dropped off to sleep again. The next day, we checked out the drop traps. Afterwards, Dad chucked us on the four-wheeler and we headed off to explore the seemingly endless hillocks and ravines. After another meal cooked over the fire, and an hour or so spent laughing at Dad's silly campfire songs, we turned in for the night, lulled to sleep by the chirping of crickets and grasshoppers. Late in the night, I was awoken again, this time with a start. I'd been kind of half awake from memory, waking from a dream, but not really waking up, when something jolted me full into consciousness. As a sleep-deprived child, it took me a few moments to work out that the world had suddenly gone completely silent. For some reason, I felt compelled to see what was happening, so I quietly crawled out to the tent to look around. As I slipped through the flap on all fours, I noticed a chill that didn't come from the warm night air. I looked up. Maybe ten metres from the tent, Standing in a semicircle were six impossibly tall figures. They almost looked like they had been poorly moulded out of clay, with no symmetry to them. Their skin was uniform grey, and their faces were entirely blank apart from two burning points of violet light that I presumed to be eyes. Then, as one, they fixed their eyes on me and began to scream. It was an awful, soul-chilling sound unlike any scream I'd ever heard before. It made the air vibrate around me, simultaneously high-pitched and ragged, yet powerful and rich. It bored into me and made my head swim. Suddenly, my dad grabbed me from behind and dragged me into the tent. He couldn't really speak. He just hushed my brother and I and held us close, 
covering our ears as best as he could. That horrendous screaming carried on for several minutes, that dragged like hours, before suddenly and completely stopping, leaving me with a loud ringing in my ears. I looked at Dad, but he just shook his head and put a finger to his lips. Eventually, I fell asleep in Dad's arms, and when we woke, he bundled us into the Land Cruiser, quickly packed all of our stuff and headed back to the farm proper. He made us promise not to mention what had happened to Mum, and that was it. Until a few years later. Anyway, when I grew up and got curious enough to ask him about it, he couldn't tell me a lot because that was the first time he had ever seen the screaming figures too, but he had heard about them. The Aboriginal drovers, whose people who have inhabited this area for thousands of years, spoke about them and called them the Screaming Men. Apparently, they come in the night and take unsuspecting victims to the spirit world. Part spirit projection, part real being. They cannot interact with our world, but because we are connected to the spirit world, their powerful scream creates enough of a ripple in the wall between the worlds to snatch a human over to the other side. That poor soul then becomes a howling spirit, doomed to walk the space between worlds, one foot on either side, but never wholly within either. Because of that encounter, I have never ever slept rough. I always make sure I have a tent or a covered swag, something to prevent the screaming men from being able to touch me directly. I've encountered them once since that night years ago, standing on a lonely hill close to the original encounter, watching me as I drove past in the same land cruiser. I don't know why they cross out over there specifically, but I try and avoid that area of the property as much as I can. I've seen a howling spirit once or twice, and I have no desire to find out what that existence is like. This story was posted on Reddit by the author, Big Pleb. This story dates back to July last year, and has enough weirdness that I find myself puzzling over what exactly happened, quite regularly. A few years ago, my best friend Toby took a cross-country grad position in Brisbane. A big tumultuous thing for our group of friends, and amid a 3am power drunk confessionals was a promise of the road trip. Eventually, the stars aligned mid-July last year, and myself, Toby, and two other friends, Chris and Alec, we're able to get the band back together, so to speak. Queensland is a weird mix of tropical paradise, dead space, crocodiles, and genuine social backwardness. Queensland is very, very much the Florida of Australia. Our plan was to fly in, cram four dudes and two weeks worth of supplies into Toby's family sedan, and straight book it 1,600 kilometers north of Brisbane to Cairns. Generally speaking, we opted for road stops, but one night, after staying too late in a particularly nice town, around 9pm, we took a left off the highway, followed the wiki camp's direction towards our campsite, about 2.5 kilometres away from the Bruce Highway. Despite the remoteness, we found the campsite, a small 30 metre clearing between the banks of an apparently crock-filled river and tall gum trees, already occupied by a single caravan attached to a four-wheel drive. Being quite familiar with camping, I felt a little awkward intruding on what I'm sure the caravan owner assumed was a private spot well after dark and made a mental note to smooth over any grievances with a cup of tea and a g'day, should we see the owner, before we left. We started setting up camp despite the frustratingly gravel thick soil. We weren't being particularly loud but must however have attracted our neighbour's attention because he flung open the caravan door within two minutes of us arriving and started one of the weirdest conversations I've ever had. Expecting a grey nomad couple and a please keep it down, I was a little surprised by the 55-ish bushy bearded man that approached us. He seemed erratically drunk and asked us if we had a bong, which we did not. I offered him a beer and he asked us where we were from. We mentioned Perth. He asked our names. We went around the group. I asked his name and he said, oh, don't worry about that. He then cleared his throat and made a joke. You know, I'm a gay prostitute. Yeah, I'm great but the other boys don't enjoy it as much. Haha. <laughs> it is also important to note that Chris and Alec were not particularly interested in this conversation. Preoccupied with tents, minimal attention was being paid. Toby made more of an effort to engage, but was tending to his swag, and I was more or less solely engaged in the conversation. Despite the shit joke, which I chalked up to different cultural sensitivities, I asked him if he minded us camping here and what he was up to tonight. He replied, Oh no, I'm just watching the state of origin. You know, I have trouble making friends. I used to have a good friend, but he was a cross-dresser, so I had to kill him. 
He said it so naturally that my general human statement interpreter again thought it was an off joke and auto response had already kicked in by the time I realised what he'd just said. Oh, how far is the river from here? Are we in range of any crocs? I asked before my brain could work out why. Oh, only about 150 metres that way with the shallow graves. You know, my friend knows where some shallow graves are up in Hervey Bay. But yeah, you know, being out there alone... I wouldn't worry about the crocs. Do you promise not to kill me if I promise not to kill you? This was enough to trigger my dumb lizard brain and a very rapid understanding of danger kicked in. Oh, do you think Queensland will win State of Origin? It would be embarrassing to lose all three games. What's the score anyway? I asked in an attempt to show I'm less scared of the snake than it is of me. Good point. Just come knock if you want some bourbon, boys, he said as he walked the 10 metres to his caravan. I immediately turned to Toby and asked how much of the conversation he'd heard. He said not much, but enough to be a little bit shaken. I asked if Toby called our bearded friend's name and he replied he had not. I immediately insisted to my friends that we take a walk to the river, despite Alec repeatedly saying, I'll be there in five, just let me finish my tent. I made it very clear that we needed to see that river, right goddamn now. In that very remote dark, we huddled around a smartphone torch. I explained the conversation I'd just had with our nameless mate. So we packed up extremely rapidly, one eye on the caravan at all times, and despite protests from Alec, we got out of there. I still have no idea if this guy was trying to play a big old joke on four mid-twenties guys, or if there is something more sinister to it. Either way, I'd rather not meet again. This story was posted on Travel on the Brain by the author Anne-Marie. A week after my Gumtree episode, I heard more creepy stranger stories on Gumtree. One of them particularly struck me as it involved solo traveling women as well. It was about two young women looking for work experience in the outback. A nice family on Gumtree was looking for an au pair. Nothing terribly unusual. Sadly, they only had need for one, but made the kind offer of asking the neighbor. It was quickly agreed that the friend would stay with the neighbors. Everything was settled and soon enough the girls were picked up by the man of the house. On the phone, he had been super nice and charming. But during the long drive to nowhere land, he was cold and taciturn, not a word he uttered. After a few hours drive, he dropped off the friend at the neighbour and then continued stone-faced. The neighbours weren't that close at all. It was the outback and distances to the nearest souls were long. Not so cool. Finally having arrived at her new temporary home, she was shown to her room on the upper floor. She stepped in. The door slammed shut, and she was locked in. To her utter shock, she found that the windows were nailed shut, and her phone had no connection. Over the next few days, she was barred from leaving the room and having any contact with the outside world whatsoever. She didn't know the fate of her friend, or what was in store for her. Her abductors didn't talk to her either. All they did was shove a little tray of food underneath the door so she wouldn't starve. They still needed her. A neighbour happened to come by one evening and saw a light in her room. Confused over this, as he wasn't aware of the room ever being used, he investigated and discovered the terrified girl. He pieced the information together and came up with a rescue plan. As soon as he knew the resident couple had left the home, he raced over with his car and released her. On the way to the police station, he took the friend as well, though she seemed to be fine. For all that I know, the couple was not caught, but the story went that they were involved in organ trading and had already secured a deal. So you better be careful who you allow to take you into the outback to not end up in your own horror story. I hope you enjoyed these stories, and if you would like to hear more Australian horror stories, then please don't hesitate to let me know or get in contact with me through my Twitter account or by email. If you would like a shout-out in upcoming videos, then leave a comment starting with Shadow Shoutout. And if you enjoyed this video, then please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to see more content like this. And don't forget to hit that notifications bell to keep up to date with the latest videos. And together, we can explore the strange, the terrifying, the unknown, the shadow matter. <laughs>